So we are looking at the book of Revelation. We are at chapter 19. So if you remember what we've been looking at uh, through chapter 17, 18, and last time we looked at the beginning of chapter 19, we looked at what was happening uh, on earth, and last time we also looked a little bit of what was happening in heaven as Jesus is actually going to return. So tonight we're looking at the main event. We're looking at the return of Jesus. Um, now, last time we looked at all the preparation, the praise as a precursor uh, for a, the preparation, like a prelude to Jesus returning. But if you remember what we've looked at in chapters 17 and 18 of the wrath of God being poured out, you'll remember that at the final bold judgment, when the, uh, the armies of Antichrist are going to gather at a place called Armageddon, Armageddon, this is actually the point that Jesus returns. But obviously you have to describe it in stages, otherwise you can't describe everything all in one go. And so what John sees is what's happening on earth, and what we're going to look at tonight is heaven's perspective. But it's actually the same event. The battle of Armageddon and the final uh, battle, as we've already seen, is as Jesus comes. But we haven't actually seen Jesus come yet. Uh, and so tonight, that's what we're going to look at. So there's this convergence. We've already seen that uh, at the end, it's it described as the wine press. Jesus is going to come, and the final judgment is God's wrath. God treads the wine press of the fury of His wrath. That's what happens when Jesus returns. Remember, He is going to judge the kingdoms of the beast, Antichrist, because they are making war against Him. They're not just not believing in Him. Uh, I mean, there's lots of things I can get my head round with the delusion of atheism. I can sort of understand, if people have been taught certain things, why they think certain things. I cannot believe anyone is stupid enough to actually decide they are going to wage war against Jesus Christ. That, that is too absurd to contemplate. Nevertheless, that is actually what's going to happen. People will literally think they can fight him. Uh, they will fight him, but there won't be much of a battle. Uh, Jesus doesn't actually fight. He just speaks, and the battle is over. But uh, that's what we're going to look at tonight, the convergence of these things. So we've looked at what was happening on earth through the judgments of God, uh, the judgments of God, and Jesus is now going to return. So we looked at those aspects last time. So let's go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. This is where we got to last time, Revelation 19 and verse 11. So here John now sees something different. So I'll read down. Actually, I might not. I might just read this first bit and then look at something. So... After everything he's seen, all the hallelujah chorus, all the praise, he says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. So let's just stop there. So what does John actually see now? The first thing is, we can miss this, he sees heaven standing open. Right? Heaven has not been open until this point. Now, in the book of Revelation, there are lots of things that are opened. Can anyone guess how many things are opened? Seven. There are seven things that are opened in stages or described as being opened in the book of Revelation. Now, if something's open, what does that mean? It's not closed. Yeah. It, it means access, it means revelation. Uh, remember, the book of Revelation literally, uh, the word apocalypto, apocalypse, literally means something is opened. The unveiling, a veil is removed, yeah? And so what John is now seeing is heaven itself is open. Everyone can see it. So when Jesus it reveals himself... Now, I don't think we fully understand what this means. Because I think what God does is he tears open 
the space-time continuum so that we actually see the dimensionality of, of things as they really are. I don't think it means we just see Jesus like in the sky or anything like that, or it might, it might have aspects of that. You remember the story of uh, Elisha and his servant in 2 Kings, where the armies were coming, and, and he says, there's more for us than for them. And the servant says, what? And he says, Lord, open his eyes. And what happened? God revealed the spiritual realm. And he actually saw the armies of heaven were camped around him. That's why Elisha wasn't scared. Now, one of the gifts of the Spirit is that the discerning of spirits. And uh, many people believe, I, I, I believe, that actually God, God can give people the ability to see into the spiritual realm. But here, everyone sees it. Because heaven itself is going to be opened. Literally, you'll see into this other dimension, which even scientists know is actually all around us. We just can't sense it or uh, contact it in any way. So heaven is going to be opened. But there are seven things. There are stages of things opening in the Bible. This is the final stage. Can we put up that chart, please, Luke? Chart one. So if you remember when we started... Uh, at the beginning of the book of Revelation. It started by God speaking to the churches, Jesus speaking to the churches about things that are going to be opened. So he speaks to uh, the church in uh, Philadelphia, uh, Revelation 3 verse 7. I think I've put it up there. Yeah, there it is. Um, he writes to this church, he says, uh, and he describes who Jesus is. And he says, what I open, no man can shut. Yeah? So right at the beginning of Revelation, when God's speaking to the churches, God's saying, look, when I open something, it's going to be opened. What did Jesus see it say when I come? Every eye will see me, because he's going to open heaven itself. We can't fully grasp this. Uh, I don't think the church there fully understood this, but we can understand this on a day-to-day -day level. If God's opening something, it's open. No one can shut it. And if God shuts it, no one can open it. Right? When God casts people, uh, the fallen angels, into the, into the abyss, they can't get out. It's shut. When he opens it, they do come out. And when he puts them back, they do get back there. So let's understand the power of God here. He is opening and God can open everything and he also said you know what is bound on earth is bound in heaven what is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven and he wants us to share in that ability of this opening and closing process now if you go to the next one down now Jesus reveals himself as the one who opens things but then he reveals to this church he says behold I place before you an open door now, they're not the same thing. In verse 7, he's, he's revealing that he can open anything. And he's going to open heaven at the end here in Revelation 19. But now he's saying to this church, look, I'm placing before you an open door. Even for that church, I'm opening something for you. Okay? Now, he wasn't opening all of heaven. He was just opening a door. There's a big difference between a door and all of heaven. Yeah, But he's opening for this church a door which I believe was into heaven because he then tells them about the, 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 he's going to save them from the hour of tribulation that's coming. So I think he's revealing to this church that he is opening a door and it is gonna, he is going to take them into heaven. I do believe that is hinting at the rapture there because this is the best church in the list of churches. You remember the next church was the worst church, Laodicea. And what did he say to that church? He says, the door's shut. I'm knocking, but you're not letting me in. And you see, throughout the Bible, whether the door is open or whether the door is shut primarily depends on our response of faith to God. Remember in the Song of Songs, the bridegroom came for the bride, and he says, you've shut the door. And he's, it says he thrusts his hand through the latch. He's trying to open the door, but, but the opening's on the inside of the door. She's got to open it. If we don't open the door for God, how can he open the door for us? We've got to be in um, agreement with him. It's the same with Noah in the ark, yeah? When, when Noah went into the ark, God shut the door. And God, uh, Jesus in his parables, he showed that the sign of the open or closed door was a symbol of whether people would be taken to heaven or not. You remember the, the foolish virgins? They were taken in, the door was shut. 
The, the, the other man in the parables, the door was shut and he was cast outside. You're not getting in now. You had your chance. You rejected me. The door's closed. When God closes it, it's closed. But to the churches, he says, look, the door's still open. Make sure we have access to God before all these things kick in. Same with Lot in Sodom. What did the angels do when they rescued Lot? They shut the door. And the people trying to get you can't get in now. I'm going to save Lot and his family. I'm not going to save you. The door was closed. It's a, it's a pattern throughout the Bible, the open or closed door. But then you'll remember in chapter 4, when John had seen the church age, when he had seen all the seven churches, then what happened? He saw a door open in heaven. Now, the others don't say a door in heaven. They just say, what's, one's just a generalization of God opening things. The other one is an open door, but that, that could have been specific to their situation. But now in Revelation 4, John sees a door literally in heaven opened. And he hears the voice saying, come up here. And John is snatched away, harpazoed. He is raptured. He's caught up into heaven. And so the door in heaven is open, but not all of heaven's open. Only John sees this door. Only the churches saw that door. Only the faithful saw that door on earth. But there was access into heaven even at that stage. Even now, God is opening a piece of heaven for the faithful to be caught into heaven. Yeah? So then we go to Revelation chapter 5. And then Jesus opens all the seals. Yeah? Now remember what John said when he saw the scroll and he heard the voice, it says no one could open the seals. But then he saw the lamb. The lamb, as if it had been slain, he is worthy to open the seals. John wept and wept because he realized no one was able to save us. There was no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. There was no one to redeem the earth. There was no one to bring in the inheritance of mankind. There was no one to bring salvation and to, to cleanse the earth or bring redemption. He recognized all these things. But there's one who can open things. Jesus can open anything. He can even open the doors of tombs. He can bring out the dead. So Jesus opens the seals. Okay, and I believe the seals, as we looked at, was the, re the redemption of the inheritance of the earth itself as well as humanity. It represents all those things. We looked at those when we looked at the, the seals. So he opens the seals. We're going to be saved. The earth is going to be redeemed. Jesus is going to sort it all out. But that's not heaven. When the seals were opened, it's everything that's happening on earth. Okay, so then we move to Revelation chapter 11. And then in Revelation chapter 11, John says he saw the temple opened. The temple opened in heaven. Now you've got to understand, um, no one ever saw inside the temple. Because only the high priest was allowed to go inside. And some of the other priests were allowed to go into the holy place, but not the holy of holies. But when Jesus died, what happened on earth? The temple on earth was opened. The veil was torn, the curtain was torn. So on earth, heaven was opened. Yeah, but this is the temple in heaven. The reality of God's presence in heaven. And so John now sees that God is opening up the temple. He's opening up a part of heaven. The temple was where representation of the presence of God on earth. So it must mean the same thing in heaven, the dwelling place of God. So God is in Revelation chapter 11, showing, look, you are having more access to me. But it's still not all of heaven. It's just a part of the presence of God. Only the Levites were allowed in, but God's saying, no, he's bringing us all in. He's bringing us all into heaven, the temple in heaven. Obviously, the church is the temple of God. We've looked at that in the past. And so then you go to Revelation 15. So what next is opened? The covenant, the, 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 uh, the covenant law is open, the Ark of the Covenant on earth, but this is in heaven. 
And so God is now getting more intimate at every stage. Can you see? First, the, you know, just a generalization of things open, then a door, but not a specific one that we know of. Then the door in heaven, then the seals, now the temple, now the ark of the covenant, the, the covenant law, the testimony of the covenant. Now, if you know the Bible, the one thing you could not open under any circumstances was the ark of the covenant. You, you, you know, whoever you are, whether you're the high priest, whether you're... Uh, just inquisitive and you think I'll just have a peek you do not under any circumstances open the ark have you seen Raiders of the Lost Ark okay even Indiana Jones he's a Jones so he knows this you do not open the ark you remember the story at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark I can't believe I'm quoting Steven Spielberg but Steven Spielberg's Jewish he knew the Bible and he knew it, so it's a wonderful end to the story because when the Nazis are going to open the ark, what does Indiana Jones do? Don't look! He tells his girlfriend, Marion, don't open your eyes. And she's going, why? He's like, just do what I tell you. Do not look inside the ark. We, uh, we downloaded that video when we went on holiday to Menorca and Jemima watched it on loop the last five minutes. She loved the Nazis melting as they looked inside the ark. <laughs> you don't look in the ark. It's totally biblical. You know, you know the story of the ark when it was captured by the Philistines and some of the, they looked inside and God killed them. You do not look in there. But what's happening as we get towards the end? God opens the ark. The presence of God. In the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. But God's presence was in the ark. He, he was seated above the cherubim of the ark of the covenant, the, the mercy seat there. But God is opening that. But that's not all of heaven. So then you get to Revelation chapter 19. What we've just read, God is going to open all of heaven. You're literally going to see straight into the spiritual realm. Now, is that a good thing? Well, it depends who you are. Now, we rejoice when we read Revelation 19. We see it, John sees heaven open. And he sees a sight that just blows his mind. He sees the Lord coming. But remember, those on earth say, hide us from that. We don't want to look at that. Because they knew it was the coming certainty of judgment and the finality of all things. So depending on who you are. So the final opening there is the opening of heaven itself, the return of Jesus, which is what everything has been leading up to. Remember, Jesus says, I'm coming and you will see me. He said it over and over again. So it's all going to be revealed. Now, we should know this because that's what the book of Revelation means. Everything's going to be revealed. So heaven itself is going to be revealed. The extra dimension of what we call heaven, the, the, the aspects of what heaven means, I don't think we, we fully grasp it all. But before Jesus can come back, this is what has to happen. You know, Jesus says, every eye will see me. Well, think about that. You know, depending on which way the earth's facing, you know, if you're in Australia or if you're up in North uh, the northern Arctic near Canada, where is Jesus so everyone can see him? Because not everybody can see the same piece of space at the same time. So this is why I believe there's a lot more to this than we can grasp in our three dimensions. I think it's, it's, it's a spiritual unveiling as well as a physical one. Remember, spirituality does not mean non-literal or non-physical. It just means extra-literal and extra-physical. And so how this all works, I don't know, but everyone's going to see him. Jesus says, you know, as lightning is in the east, so it shall be in the coming of the Son of Man. Everyone will suddenly see him, however uh, that works. Some people say it's because uh, those on the wrong side of the world will be watching TV. Well, that, that might be, there might be some truth to that, but I, I think it's a lot more emphatic than that. I think somehow everyone will see uh, the appearance of Jesus, okay? So let's go back to Revelation 19, then in verse 11. So this is what's happening. Heaven is going to be opened at this point. I see heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. Right, let's just stop there. Why a white horse? It's interesting, you know, that the kings of Israel were forbidden from riding horses. Did you know that? 
Yes, they were. They were to hamstring the horses. If you see David, he rides a mule or a donkey. Yeah? It was only after Solomon's time that they broke the Levitical prohibition on the kings of Israel riding horses because God knew there's only one person riding horses and that's the Messiah who comes into Jerusalem. And, and that was such a clear thing, and I know I've said this before, but when General Allenby of the British Army in 1917 entered Jerusalem, he got off his horse because the British uh, ambassadors and the, the hierarchy says, you do not ride a horse into Jerusalem. Only the Messiah does that. And we are not saying that the British General Allenby is the Messiah. So get off your horse, and he walked in, something that a conquering general would never do. He walked in because they knew that Jesus enters Jerusalem riding a white horse. Why a white horse? You see, in Revelation, there's five things that are white. Five is the number of grace. And so each of these things that are white is showing us that God has given us the fullness of grace. He's, he's given us the fullness of everything that is represented by white. I'm sure you, you know what the white things are. The clothing for a start. Jesus gives us white clothing. Yeah? He's going to sit on judgment on a white throne. Yeah? It says his hair is white. Yeah? White like wool. Hair is a sign of someone's glory. The glory of Jesus is white. Totally pure. Totally holy. He's coming on a white cloud. So he's coming with people that are white. He's riding something that's white. He sits on something that's white. All these things are white. He looks white. Uh, obviously, no racial connotations here. That's, that's a total fabrication by sociologists. We're talking about uh, the symbolism, symbolism of white in the Bible. And it says, those who believe in him, he gives them a white stone. What does that mean? Well, there's five white things, the number of grace. He gives us grace. Grace to be holy and pure. It's not something we can earn by ourselves. It's something given to us by the grace of God. So when he came the first time, he came on a donkey. Be told, your, your, your Savior comes riding on a donkey to fulfill the prophecies. Uh, but the second time, he comes on a white horse. But there's already been someone come on a white horse. Who was that? The Antichrist. You remember when the seals were opened, Antichrist fabricates the coming of Jesus. He comes on a white horse. He pretends he brings the answer to man's problem. He's going to sort out the earth. And remember, the earth accepts him as the Messiah. Or most of the earth, they accept him as the false Messiah. They think he's the real Messiah. No, this is the real one. And there's no comparison. The false Messiah has one crown. This Jesus has many crowns. We don't know how many, perhaps hundreds of millions. We don't know how many crowns he has because everyone casts their crown at his feet. So he has all these crowns. Okay, so I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Okay, now, once again, the, the, the names of Jesus in the, in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation, are always giving an indication, a denotation of his character. Now, he's faithful and he's true. Okay, now, guess how many times he's called true in the Bible, or the word true occurs in Revelation? It is seven. Well done, Will. You're on form tonight. It's seven times in, in Revelation we find this word true true now what does true mean jesus is called faithful and true yeah i don't think we really know what truth is we're so bombarded with people claiming to tell us the truth and we find out it's not we often relegate truth to just someone's opinion oh that's just your opinion you can quote the bible at someone will say well that's just your opinion jesus is truth if you want to know what truth is, you look at Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Right? Jesus would often say, uh, now depending on which Bible you have, uh, Old King James would be verily, verily. It means truth, truth. True, true. And modern translations, uh, they say, I'm telling you the truth. But it's actually truth stated twice. Jesus is saying, I'm true, true. Do you understand what truth is? When Jesus stood before Pilate... 
And he says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. I'm true. And what did Pilate say? What's truth? Do you know why he said that? Because he's a politician. <laughs> Politicians don't know what truth is. You know, they'll say one thing and do another. They'll give you a vote on one thing and then refuse to ratify it. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, well, no, you've not told the truth. You said this, you've done that. You, you're not truthful. You've not told the truth. And, and truth is a commodity that is so prized when you realize how hard it is to get at it. You know, you can't watch the news and get the truth. You'll get, their, you'll get what they want to tell you. They might not even tell you some stuff that's happening. They're, they're more likely to tell you what their agenda is. They actually, they actually frame the news. They, they make events happen rather than just reporting on what's happening. So we're surrounded by it. You can't believe what you read, what you hear, because it all comes with these political and philosophical agendas. The only way to get truth is through Jesus and his word. His, Jesus says, my word is truth. So he's called faithful and true. So Jesus says, I am coming back. Is that true? Yes. How do you know? But he doesn't just say true. He says, faithful and true. You see, you can say something's true, but then not be faithful in delivering it. Yeah? yeah. And we're used to that all the time. Oh, yes, I, I will honor the, the democratic vote. Just not yet. <laughs> well, you're not being faithful then with what you said. You, you said something, and you're saying it's true, and you're saying it's believe it, you believe it, and you go, but you're not actually doing it. So you're not being faithful with what you claim to be the truth. Well, that's not truth. And so what God does in Revelation, he adds an appendage onto truth seven times so that we understand what real truth is. So Jesus says, I'm coming back. Is that true? Is he going to deliver it? Yes. He's not just saying the truth. You see, Jesus could say, I'm coming back. And then six billion years later, he's still not come back. So it's true, but it's, it's sort of, well, it's true, but it's never actually going to be delivered. No, he's faithful. It's going to be delivered on time when he said it was going to happen. Now, that might not be our timing, but it is going to be delivered because Jesus is faithful. Remember when Jesus uh, was leaving his disciples, he said, I tell you the truth, I am going away. I tell you the truth, I'm coming back again. And I'm coming to take you to be with me. Amen. Is he faithful in delivering that? Yes. Oh, yes. He is faithful and true. You know, even a man who proposed to a woman, if he proposed marriage, if he was a half-decent man, at least he's going to follow through on his proposal. Well, Jesus proposed marriage to his church. He says, I'm coming to get you, and I'm taking you to the wedding banquet. He's not just telling the truth. He's faithful. Totally faithful, okay? So, he's true, but he's also these other things. So there we've just seen in Revelation 19, faithfulness added to truth. But there's also other things he adds to truth seven times in the book of Revelation. So, can we go to uh, the next chart, please, Luke? So the church that we just looked at, the best church, the best church, the church at Philadelphia. Just bring the next one down, please. Revelation 3, verse 7. So this was the best church. And how did he speak to this church? He didn't just say, uh, behold, I put before you an open door. He didn't just say, I, what I open, no man can shut. He says, he, I am the one who is holy and true so here God attaches holiness to truth so he doesn't just tell the truth he is holy I the Lord am holy be ye holy for I am holy God's not actually telling you to do something there that you can't do he's saying because I'm holy I'm going to impute my holiness into you so you will be holy. You will live a holy life. That's true, but it's also real. It's not a theological understanding. Holiness 
is a practical outworking. And this is something many Christians don't have today. This is why they don't grasp holiness. They can say the Bible's true and then not live a holy life. No, no, no. If you believe the Bible's true, you live a holy life. Jesus doesn't just tell you things. He gives you his holiness, his purity. What is holiness? I have no idea. It's God. You know when you step into the holy presence of God. You know when the holiness of God, it's, it's, the, it's just the difference of everything that God is. His love, his purity, it's all the attributes of God are summed up in that word. Holiness. You know, the glory, the kabod, the kadesh, the, 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 the wonderful presence of God. So this is what it is. Is. And he's talking to the church at Philadelphia here because they're suffering persecution and trial. And he's saying, you're going to make it because I'm giving you my holiness. Without holiness, no one can see God. Well, then none of us can see God. He, we, yes, but he's given us his holiness. This is truth. Yeah? Truth. God is holy. Jesus is the holy one and also the truth. Okay, the next thing... In Revelation 13, verse 14, he uses the word faithful again. Now, we've already just seen that in, uh, in Revelation uh, chapter 19, where the writer is called faithful and true. Now, he reveals himself to the best church as holy and true. But who's he talking to in Revelation 3, 14? He's talking to the worst church. He doesn't call himself holy and true to the worst church. To the worst church, he calls himself faithful and true. Why? Well, because they weren't being faithful. And what's Jesus showing them? He's saying, look, they claim to believe the truth, the church at Laodicea. Yeah, we believe the truth. Yeah, but they weren't being faithful with it. They certainly weren't being holy. And you see, Jesus is saying, look, I'm faithful even when you're not. You might not be faithful, but I am. I'm going to keep my word. I'm knocking at the door. I want to take you to be with me, but you're not being faithful. And we read that in the New Testament. Even if we are faithless, he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. Right? Faithfulness is who God is. He doesn't just tell the truth. He will always be faithful in delivering. He says to the church at Laodicea, I am the faithful witness. You see, they weren't being faithful witnesses. They were just living for themselves. They weren't being witnesses at all. They were just living their own selfish lives. But Jesus says, I'm going to be a faithful witness. You'll find out everything I said was true, and I was faithful in delivering it. Okay, next one, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10. Now, here he uses the word holy again. He links holy to true. Remember, we're looking at this word true. Jesus is the true one, but he links it to different attributes so that we can grasp what truth is. When you get close to God, what do the cherubim and the angels, what do people say? Holy, holy, holy. They don't say truth, truth, truth. They know it's true, but now they appreciate God's holiness. So a greater revelation of his holiness as you go through revelation. The next one... In Revelation chapter 15, so God here reveals Jesus as true once again, but here it says just and true. Just are his ways. Different Bible translations might use a different word. You see, sometimes we know what God says is true, but we don't appreciate the way he goes about things. Just are your ways, we read there. Righteous are your ways in some versions. You see, as a pastor, I come across this all the time. You'll, people will say this to me. What you said was true, but you shouldn't have done it like that. Or what you said was true, but you didn't have to do it that way. Or, I don't disagree with what you said, but I disagree with the way you did it. Okay, I get that all the time. You'll get that all the time as well, if you want to speak the truth. Whenever you speak the truth, there'll be someone say you didn't do it right. You won't be able to accuse God of that. People will. Well, I know God's telling the truth, but I don't like the way he did it. Well, tough. Because God is not just true, 
He's just. And just and righteous are his ways. It said the way God does it is the best way to do it. Now, if we had been, now we can think that once again, just as a, you know, an abstract thought. But just imagine if you were following Jesus every day on earth. Think of some of the stuff he did. I mean, you, you may very well have been tempted to go, hmm, did we really need a whip in church today, Lord? I know what you said was true, but did you really have to go up to that bloke and kick his table over? Did you really have to throw all that money on the floor? Did you really have to open those cages and let that man's doves appear? I mean, a whip. He might, come on, he's got a whip. He walks into church with a whip. Second Indiana Jones uh, <laughs> reference tonight. Right, I'm sure there were some of his followers going, well, I know what Jesus said is true, but I'm sure there was a better way of doing it than that. And you can say that for a lot of, you know, some of his preaching. I'm like, I'm sure you didn't have to be, I mean, you really offended them by speaking like that. Couldn't you have just said it a little bit nicer? No. Not only does he tell the truth, his ways are just. And what Jesus is coming to do when he's bringing truth on earth in Revelation 19, he's doing it the best way it can be done. It's no good mankind and secular humanism saying, well, I can't accept a God that will bring judgment. Well, he is. Because he has to. Because it's the only way of saving the planet. There is no other way at this point for God to do this. It's the only way he can save the planet. It's the only way he can save people. He's not just doing the truth. He's doing it the best way he can. Okay, just are he, his ways. How he does things is the right way for it to be done. Okay, next one. Revelation chapter 16. Righteous and true. Now again, different Bible translations might use a different word. Uh, King James might use a slightly different word. But here it says, his, uh, his judgments are righteous and true. You see, once again, when someone is passing judgment, we can very easily sit and judge that person saying they have no right to judge. In fact, people do that all the time. Well, you have no right to judge because, you know, you don't understand that situation or you've got faults in your own life. And so we're very good at um, claiming that judgment is wrong. But God's judgment is always righteous. He's not just telling the truth. He's passing judgment. And it is righteous. It is the right thing to do. And because of the emphasis of grace, remember Jesus came to bring grace and truth, right? We emphasize grace and we push truth to one side as though, well, we've just got to show them grace. Yeah, but you've got to stand for truth as well. Otherwise, grace just becomes license to sin. It's always perfectly balanced. And so when God is bringing judgment here, he's not just bringing the truth, he's doing it in a righteous way. It's the only option left. We've got to understand that judgment is sometimes the best thing to do. It's the only way of trying to save someone, pass judgment on it, and let it be sorted out. Okay, next one. In Revelation 19, just before where, where we've got to, uh, we're told here that um, God's judgment is true. You see, what's happening in Revelation 19, war has started. Now, war's never good. Well, is it? You know, that I think there are times in history, think of the Nazis. You know, was there any other option? What could you do? Hitler, what, appease him more? Give him another country? Give him more Jews to burn? What could you physically do? There was no option. We had to go to war. We had to fight that evil, because otherwise the entire earth would have just been taken over by this, the evil of Nazism. And, and, and the judgment here in Revelation 19, they're saying, true are your judgments, because God is saying there's going to be a war now. And sometimes we can once again overemphasize the niceness of things and say, well, war is never good. Well, actually, it depends how evil evil is. 
there comes a point where you have to attack evil, otherwise it will kill everybody. It will destroy everybody. And God's judgment of this final conflict that comes here in Revelation 19 is going to happen. And here he's passing judgment on the Babylonian system that is killing people, destroying people, persecuting people, worshipping Satan himself. And God's saying, right, I'm coming to sort this out. There's going to be a big fight. And that is a truthful thing and a right judgment. God has to do it. It's not an arbitrary opinion. It is truth that God passes his judgment and he condemns Babylon there, uh, as we've already read previously. And then we get to Revelation 19, 11, which is what we've just read. Jesus, the rider on the white horse, is called faithful and true again. So he uses the word faithful again, and it says, with justice he wages war. Remember, Jesus has said this is going to happen. It's not just truth. He's going to be faithful in delivering it. It's going to happen. So, there we've got the seven aspects of truth in Revelation, all linked to something tangible, something real, something practical, something that we must lay hold of, not just truth as an abstract thought, but truth as a living reality that God is going to fulfill. So he's going to bring, he's going to bring this war. That's why the rider is coming. So uh, how many times do you think war is mentioned in Revelation? Six. Who said six? No, it's seven. It is seven. Yeah. It's seven. It's always seven, Will, except when it's not. It's always seven, except when it's another number. But it's nearly always seven, unless it's pointing to a, another aspect. But it is, it is seven. Now, again, why is it seven if seven's perfection? Well, we tend to think of war as bad, and primarily human war is always bad. But you've got to remember, uh, it is going to end in a war. There is going to be a battle. God has said this very clearly uh, all the way through the Bible. And here Jesus makes it emphatic. So let's go back to uh, Revelation 19 and verse uh, 16. Sorry, verse 11. Revelation 19 and verse 11. So I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. He doesn't wage war in any old way. He does it with justice and with correct judgment. So what is happening in Revelation? To look at these wars, seven times the word war is mentioned here. Can we go to the next chart, please, Luke? So war in Revelation. So first aspect of the war in Revelation. Revelation 12, verse 7, it says there is war in heaven. Okay? Satan, the dragon, fights against Michael and his angels. Satan, the dragon, and his angels fight against Michael and his angels. So the first time we see war, war's already occurred in heaven. Yeah, before war on earth has happened, there's, always be, there's already been a rebellion in heaven. You remember we've looked at the three rebellions. There's the rebellion of Satan against God. There's the rebellion against the fallen angels against God. And then there's the rebellion of mankind. When there's rebellion, there's always going to be a war. Always. That's what rebellion is. And so because these rebellions happen, there will be wars. Satan rebelled against God in heaven, so there's going to be a war in heaven. Now, who does Satan the dragon fight? It's up there. Michael, the archangel. He doesn't fight Jesus. Don't think for one minute that Satan against Jesus would be a fair fight. Jesus does not have to fight Satan. Jesus is God. Satan is a created being. He can't even stand in the presence of Jesus unless Jesus lets him. When Jesus comes, Satan, the beast, the false prophet are destroyed when Jesus opens his mouth. Jesus doesn't fight. 
I know it's a war, and I know there's going to be a battle, and there's this thing happening. But don't think. Some people think like it's Satan against Jesus as like a boxing match. There will be no contest. Jesus is God, right? Michael fights again. It's it's an angelic battle. Okay, the angels of righteousness against Satan and his angels. Don't think it's God fighting Satan. God doesn't have to fight anybody. He just speaks and everything vanishes. He just speaks and everything's created. Don't diminish God's power by thinking he has to have a fisticuffs with a dragon. He doesn't. It's Michael, and that's on, that's in heaven. Okay, next one. The next time war is mentioned, now this is a war, but this one is on earth. Okay, so the war starts in heaven, but Satan's cast to earth, so now he brings war on earth. Okay, so now the dragon wages war against the woman. So what's happening now? Satan has to persecute those who belong to Jesus or those who believe in Jesus. Now, we looked, when we looked at this in Revelation chapter 12, it's not the church. The church has already been caught to, caught to the Lord at this time. This is the believers on earth, primarily Israel. Remember what happened in Genesis chapter 3, back in the garden. When Satan tempted the woman to rebel, God said, I place enmity between your seed and her seed. They will continually be at war. Satan's war is always on the promise of God. He hates the church. He hates Israel. He hates women. Now, if you don't know the history of mankind, you do not know there's been a war on women. Satan's strategy is to destroy women, to, to, to manipulate them, to control them, to put them down, because he knows life is birthed through women. Right? Men can't birth life. Women birth life. And so his plan has always been to destroy woman. And he uses religion, he uses culture, he uses politics, he uses all these things to de try and destroy the woman because he knew that the Messiah would be born of a woman, not born of a man, born of a woman. And so everything the woman represents, and we've looked at that uh, over time, that's why Jesus always lifted up women. Yeah, he rebuked men, but he wouldn't let women be rebuked. Have you ever noticed that? Because Jesus knows the, re the real essence of the war. He knows the woman represents his church. So even when a woman should have been stoned to death, Jesus says, no, you're not. He lifted her. He told her not to sin. But he says, I don't condemn you. Because he knew there was a war on women. Right? Even when the disciples were, were uh, criticizing Mary for pouring out the, you know, the, uh, the ointment, the... The perfume on Jesus, what did Jesus say? Leave her alone. She has done a beautiful thing for me. Jesus would not wage a war on the women because he knew what the women represented. Satan's the opposite. He wants the women to be oppressed and put down because he hates women because they are a picture of God's people, the church. And that's why false religions will also always oppress women, make them cover up, give them no rights. They're not even fit to drive. They can't do anything. They can't vote. They're not allowed to read. They're not allowed, all, all these restrictions on women. It comes from the satanic enmity that was, a, that was there right in the garden. Satan's war is on women. But it's, it's the dragon. So it's the, it's the symbolism of what this means as well. That the woman represents the bride of Christ, Israel as well. And the dragon, obviously, the symbol of Satan. Okay, so that's the second war. What's the third war? Uh, the third war is in Revelation 13 and verse 4. And this is where uh, the beast attacks all the nations of the world. He conquers the world. So he literally wants to be the dictator, the, the ruler of the world. And so he wages war on earth. These, these are on earth. And he controls the world through warfare. He becomes the superpower of the day, if you like. Just like the Antichrist empires throughout history have always sought to control every nation, whether it was Rome, whether it was Babylon, whether it was Persia, whether it was Greece, whether it was Egypt, whether it was the Assyrian empires, all these empires in the Bible, they wage war to create domination over God's people. Antichrist will be the same. He will, it will be done through coercion and power. So the next one, the next war, the fourth one, 
This is the beast again. Obviously, these are all Satan. You know, Satan, the dragon, the beast, they're just different manifestation of Satan's system. So the beast here uh, wages war against Israel. So once he controls the nations, he is going to get the nations to attack Israel. Okay, now if you can't see that now, I don't know what planet you're on. The nations increasingly are focusing their powers more and more, more of them each year that passes against Israel. Why? Because the war has always been against Israel. The, the essence of Satan's hatred is anti-Semitism. There, there has never been a, a year in human history where anti-Semitism is not expressing itself in some way. There's no other nation that is hated. Anyway, you could add all the nations together, they're not hated like Israel's hated. Because it's a spiritual reality. It's Satan working through whatever nation, whatever religion, whatever system. Here it's a world system. We've got to attack Israel. It's the essence of anti-Semitism. And if you tolerate anti-Semitism, they'll hate the church as well. It's the same spirit. Anti-Semitism is the same as Christian hatred. People who hate the Jews will also end up hating the church if they don't already, because it's the same satanic spirit. So war against Israel. I don't know why they do, because they always lose. Because God said Israel's always going to exist. But even towards the end, when the climax reaches its fullness of these wars, there's going to be an all-out assault of all the nations of the world against Israel. That's when Jesus is going to return. Okay, so the next one which we've already looked at these, there's the ten horns of the beast wage war against the lamb. Now, the ten horns, as we saw, are the ten nations, the ten primary nations that Antichrist is going to gather to wage war against the lamb himself. So once he's got anti-Semitism established, he then can bring direct anti-Christian, because the lamb is obviously Jesus, the Messiah. He can, he can persecute believers in Jesus, even if they're not Jewish or belong to Israel. So he's going to get the nations of the world to literally wage war against any form of Christianity. So the world is, is going to make it illegal to be a Christian. Now we can see that now in many nations, though in fact the biggest nations of the world are already doing this right now. China, the biggest nation in the world, it's illegal to be a Christian. You know, you, you, the government will persecute you and do all kinds of horrendous things. I don't even think we know the totality of what China is doing to believers, but uh, it's part of the Antichrist system. Okay, so we've got these. Now, the next one is where we've already got to in Revelation chapter 11. Okay, so once this has reached its climax, the, the, the war in heaven, the war on earth, the, against the woman from the dragon, against Israel, against all the nations, against Christians himself, Jesus now wages war. But it is a retaliation and defense. He's not attacking because he wants to invade and annihilate and control. He now has no option. If the earth is going to exist, he has to wage war against Antichrist. Remember, Jesus says, unless I cut short those days, no one would survive. Antichrist will literally destroy every living organism on the planet. There would be no earth. So Jesus has to come and bring war to stop that happening. But by this point, the whole world, man's you know, humanistic, secular system of hatred and atheism and hatred of Israel, hatred of Christianity has reached such a point, Jesus actually has to come and wage war against the whole world. Because the whole world wants to destroy him and um, the concept of him in the minds of mankind, as well as destroy the planet itself. So Jesus has to do this. And then in Revelation 19, the next one, Revelation 19, there's the war mentioned again. But this time, it's not just Jesus, it's the armies of heaven itself. And we'll look at those in a moment. And that final war what we call the Battle of Armageddon, when Jesus returns, is against between all the children of Satan, the kings of the earth, and the children of God, the armies of heaven. Once again, it's the battle there uh, is won by Jesus speaking, but he still has an army with him, because the army means more than just uh, uh, military might. It's obviously his bride, his family, who are with him. 
okay? So he brings his people with him there. It's interesting when Jesus stood before Pilate, and Pilate was saying, you are a king then. And Jesus says, yes, I am a king for this reason I was born. He says, but my kingdom is not now. My kingdom comes from another place. He says, if my kingdom was now, my followers would fight. But it's not now. But when it does come, his followers will fight. Now, I don't think this is with physical military weapons. I think it's with the truth with the light, with the glory of God, with the reality of who, who Jesus is. I don't think it's physically us, you know, firing missiles or having guns even. In fact, when you see the armies of heaven riding with Jesus, it gives a full description of them. And the one thing you notice is they're not armed. So it's, I don't think it's, uh, the symbolism there is militaristic, but uh, I don't think it physically means we're going to be killing people at all. I think it's following Jesus uh, as the captain of the heavenly host. So let's go back to uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 then. Are you all still with me? We're still on one verse, aren't we? Okay. So with justice... Uh, he judges and wages war. So he's bringing that war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. Remember, Antichrist has a crown, but Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. Right? Ultimately, we don't know everything about God. We know lots of names about him, his attributes that he's revealed to us. But when he comes, his eyes are blazing like fire, and no, he will reveal himself in a way that no one's ever seen before. We don't know him like this. Remember, according to Hebrew understanding, your name denotes your character. It reveals who you really are. So when it says no one knows his name, it means he's revealing himself in a way now that no one's ever seen. No one's ever seen that. He is the, in fact, Hebrews today will call him Hashem, the name. They don't pronounce his name. They think it's too irreverent because he is the name, the name above all names. He's the, the Hashem, his name that no one knows. If you go to the next verse, he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. So it's just told us we don't know what his name is, but then it tells us actually we do know what his name is because we've got the word of God. So we know who he is. We know what his name is because we've read the word of God. So that's what his name is. He's, he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Now, there's two applications of this, uh, and no one's fully sure which one it is. It's dipped in blood because he comes to earth and the war, there's so much bloodshed. It's, it's his garments are splattered with blood because he's quoting there from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. His garments splattered with blood as he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. Or it's referring to his own blood. Because you remember his own garments when they whipped him and pulled the flesh off him so he was, he was covered in blood. Then they put his clothes back on him. So his own clothes were covered in his own blood representing the atonement uh, that he brought for us all. So either of those or both of those could be true. Okay, so the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. Okay, so... What, uh, what I want us to look at now, can we go to the next slide, please, Luke? What I just want us to look at is how does all this happen? How does all this happen? You see, when Jesus returns, um, some people think there's just going to be a flash in the sky and then suddenly everything's put right. And that's not what the Bible shows us. The Bible shows us there is a very clear process, a very clear process through which Jesus is going to return. And this process um, covers lots of different aspects. Now, let me give you an example to try and explain what I'm talking about. When Jesus came the first time, yeah, where did he come from? He came from heaven, okay. But he came from heaven to earth, yeah, the first time. And the second time, he's going to come from heaven to earth, yeah. So if you were on earth at the, the time of Jesus coming, 
and you knew that Messiah was going to arrive, where would you go to meet him? It's not a trick question. Bethlehem, yeah? Why would you go to Bethlehem? But before he came, how would you know he was coming to Bethlehem? Because it's prophesied, but you, Bethlehem, are by no means least in the tribes of Judah. Out of you will come the ruler who is from of old. So it was prophesied he was coming to Bethlehem, yeah? So you knew that when Jesus came, the Messiah came, you knew that he was coming to Bethlehem, yeah? Okay. So the Bible also said he will be called a Nazarene. Where did he actually come from? Nazareth. Now make your mind up, because Nazareth is nowhere near Bethlehem. They are total opposite ends of the country. So if you wanted to meet Messiah, would you go to Bethlehem or would you go to Nazareth? It depends, yeah. You see, it's, it, you see but in the Jewish mind, it's just like, oh, he's, he's in Bethlehem. Well, actually, he's also in Nazareth. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he's going to be called the Nazarene, so, right, okay, he's going to be in two places. Is he going to be in two places at once? Well, no, he's going to move from Bethlehem, and so if you miss that bit, you'll have to go get him at Nazareth, yeah? Okay? You still with me? Yeah. Right, it also says, out of Egypt I have called my son. Yeah. So hold on a minute. Is he in Bethlehem? Is he in Nazareth? Or is he in Egypt? Did he live in Egypt? Yes. Now, I'm getting really confused now, because not only is Bethlehem nowhere near Nazareth, uh, Egypt's a totally different country. So if you're waiting for the Messiah, you might not even be in the right country. So can you see, there's all, but these are all prophecies. This is not just what Jesus did. He didn't just come to Bethlehem and then go to Nazareth and then go live in Egypt. Or he went to Egypt before he went to Nazareth. But can you see, he came, the first time he came, he actually went to different places. Right? And it was all prophesied in advance. So unless you grasp the whole of the prophecies, you might not really understand when he came the first time where he was or what he was doing or what he was going to do. Yeah? yeah. Now, what about the prophecy, O oh, you Galilee of the Gentiles, the land of Naphtali and Zebulun, out over you a light has dawned. Hold on, is he going to Galilee as well? Because Nazareth's actually west of Galilee. So is he in Bethlehem, is he in Egypt, is he in Nazareth, or is he on the Lake of Galilee? Yeah, he's in Galilee as well. Well, he's all over the place then. Yeah? Now, hold on a minute. He comes to bring salvation to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's not in Galilee, or Nazareth, or Egypt, or Bethlehem. So, so can you see, all the prophecies of Jesus' first coming were all sort of contradictory, because they all said different things. But they're all true, because Jesus came and delivered a process of salvation, his life. Yeah, he would be born in Bethlehem. Yes, he would go to Egypt. Yes, he would go to Nazareth. Yes, he would go to Capernaum on the Lake of Galilee and, and bring salvation. Yes, he would go to Jerusalem and preach and do his miracles. There he would die. There he would be resurrected. So they're all true, but unless you grasp all of them, you're going to get very confused, even when he came the first time, about what, what he'd come for, yeah? Now, when he comes the second time, there's similar things happening. Sometimes we just think, again, there's going to be a flash in the sky and suddenly we're in the millennium and everything's perfect. That's not what the Bible says. When Jesus returns, there is going to be a process of his return where he is going to strategically fulfill prophecies that have already been given and he's going to bring salvation over the whole earth but he's going to do it according to a predetermined, pre-designed, prophetically inspired process that he's already given us in advance. So he told them, you will see me coming on the clouds with great glory. He said that even at his first coming. He repeated that actually many times. Every eye will see me. Even at his trial, you remember when they said, are you the blessed one of God? What did he say? Yes. And you will see me coming with my Father's glory, with the angels, and with great power, you will see me coming on the clouds. Remember, Jesus is giving them a very clear statement of truth 
of what he's going to do. So every eye is definitely going to see him. But there is still going to be a process of how that happens. Now, the first thing we know as he returns is that the armies are going to be gathered at Armageddon. Yeah? We've already read that in Revelation 16, but it's prophesied all the way through the Old Testament. Okay, the nations of the world are going to gather at Megiddo, Ha Megiddo, the mountains of Megiddo. Okay, that is not where Jesus is coming to. Right, Jesus isn't going to Megiddo. That's where the armies of the nations are going to gather to invade Israel. It's not the objective of Jesus. Although there is going to be a battle there, that's not where Jesus is going. Um, now, I suppose one of the best examples would be D-Day and the Second World War, yeah? Where was D-Day? It was the invasion of the beaches of Normandy. So Winston Churchill and uh, General Eisenhower and President Roosevelt, what they wanted, they wanted a beach in Normandy. No. They didn't want a beach in Normandy. They wanted to conquer Berlin. The beaches of Normandy were where the, the gathering point was of the armies, right? That was not their objective. That was just their immediate objective. Their plan was to conquer Germany. Harmageddon, Armageddon is the gathering point of the nations. But the nations have got another objective, and Jesus has got another objective. Yeah? That's just the assembly point. And that's why when you read in Psalm 2, God says, why do the, the nations rage and, and rage against the Holy One? I am setting my king on my holy hill. That's God's objective to where Jesus is coming. Now, the next thing we need to understand, aspects of the return of Jesus. He's going to deal with Babylon. Now, we looked at what Babylon was. Uh, meant and represented over and over again all its systems of culture and government and religion and everything it represents but you've got to understand he's going to deal with the whole world he's not just coming to Israel he's going to sort out the whole world and we see this in fact let's go there Isaiah 13 and verse 1 can we go there Isaiah 13 and verse 1 so he's going to deal with Babylon. This has been prophesied in all the prophets. A prophecy against Babylon that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. Raise a banner on a bare hilltop. Shout to them, beckon to them to enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded those I prepared for battle. I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath. Those who rejoice in my triumph. Let's go down two more verses. Listen, a noise on the mountains like that of a great multitude. The, Isaiah is prophesying about what's going to happen when Jesus returns. This is what this prophecy is. You read the whole context, it makes it clear. An uproar amongst the kingdoms like nations massing together. The Lord Almighty is mustering an army for war. This is what we read in Revelation 19. Isaiah is prophesying it in advance. They come from faraway lands, from the ends of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his wrath to destroy the whole country. He's talking about the return of Jesus Christ with the armies of heaven. And he's going to, if you read the whole context of Isaiah there, which we, we don't have time to do, he's going to destroy Babylon. He's not just going to destroy the armies. He's bringing down man's antichrist kingdom. That's what he's going to do. Jeremiah says the same thing, especially in chapter 50. And we've already looked at that in Revelation 17 and 18. Babylon is going down to fall. Okay, let's go back to the chart. So there's going to be the battle at Armageddon. There's going to be the destruction of Babylon and man's systems and all that represents that we've looked at in the past. But the next one, which I'm sure we already know, is coming to Jerusalem. That's the primary objective. That's the bullseye on God's timetable, but it's also the bullseye on Satan's plans. That's why the United Nation does not want the Jews to have Jerusalem. Because when the Jews have Jerusalem, Jesus can come back. And they don't want Jesus to come back. Now, I'm sure the officials in the United Nations don't know why they think that. They're just following along with the satanic system. But Satan knows the Jews cannot have Jerusalem. Well, guess what? They've already got it. So Jesus can come back. 
There's got to be a temple to be built first. So if you go to Zechariah 12 and verse 2, let's go there. So this is the process that Jesus is going to follow. Now, I think I put it in the right order, but it's debatable whether this is the exact order. So there's going to be Armageddon. He's going to deal with Babylon. All this is as he returns. Now he says this. This is Zechariah prophesying what's going to happen when the Lord comes, the day of the Lord. I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. The armies are going to invade Israel. The armies are going to invade Jerusalem. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. So the armies of Antichrist are going to attack Jerusalem, not just Israel. And Jesus is going to return at that point. Remember Jesus said this on the Olivet Discourse, when you see Jerusalem surrounded... Lift up your heads. Your redemption is drawing nigh when you see all these things begin to take place. Now jump to uh, Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14 and verse 1. So Zechariah, the very apocalyptic book, talking about the, the return of Jesus. A day of the Lord is coming. Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. Jerusalem will, it will appear Jerusalem has been totally captured. There's no hope for it. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. This has never happened. There's never been a time where all the nations of the world have attacked Jerusalem. It happens at the return of Jesus Christ. The city will be captured. The houses ransacked. The women raped. Half of the city will go into exile. But the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. One more verse. Then the Lord... When? When Jerusalem's attacked. So there's Armageddon, there's the nations of the world. Now these all might be events very close together, but they are still a sequence of events. The Lord will go out and fight against these nations as he fights on a day of battle. So he's coming to Jerusalem. Yes, he's going to win the battle of Armageddon. Yes, he's going to deal with Babylon. Remember, we read all the nations of the world collapse, such is the, the power of this conflict. But he's coming to Jerusalem. Okay, let's go back to the chart. I could read all Zechariah. It's all very prophetic. Let's go to the next one. Now, this is one that a lot of Christians miss. When he comes, and he, he does the first three, as we understand, there is a continual prophecy in the Old Testament of God going to Basra. And what does that mean? Do you even know where Basra, Basra is? Basra uh, is uh, today southern Jordan. In biblical times, it would have been in the, the, the territory of Edom, Esau. Um, remember what we looked at when we looked at Antichrist uh, attacking Israel. There was one nation that Antichrist couldn't attack. Well, there were actually three nations. Ammon, Moab, Edom. Today, that is all one nation. It's the nation of Jordan. Bosra is in Jordan. Remember Jesus says, when you see the armies, those who are faithful flee to the mountains of Jordan. Now, in the first century, that's exactly what the Christians did. When the Romans came, those who believed, when they saw the Romans coming, they fled to Jordan, what is modern-day Jordan. That's what, exactly what's going to happen at the second coming. The faithful remnant escape from Jerusalem and go to what is today modern Jordan, Moab, Ammon, and uh, Edom in biblical times. Now, if we go to Isaiah 63 and verse 1, can we go there? Now, Jeremiah talks about this. Micah talks about it as well. Uh, but a lot of people in their understanding of end times and eschatology sort of miss this bit out. But Jesus is going to do this. Now, if you think about it, 
if when the armies of Antichrist attack Israel and come to Armageddon and Babylon takes control and they attack Jerusalem, those who are faithful, who have become believers and are believing what Jesus says, they're not going to stay there, are they? They're going to run like Jesus told them, get out to the mountains. Yeah? And remember, it's in the Jewish context. Pray this does not happen on the Sabbath. Yeah? Well, why would he say that if it was just the church? Because we'd go anyway on the Sabbath, but the Jew, there's no transport for Jews on the Sabbath because it's referring primarily to the Jewish people. Okay, so they run to this place, Jordan. Some people identify Bosra with the modern-day term Petra. Now, if you know Petra, Petra is an abandoned city in southern Jordan, and they reckon you can fit between one and two million people there. Now, there is no way in for a vehicle to Petra. The only way in is through a very narrow... If you've seen a lot of films, they always use Petra as the backdrop because it's such a spectacular... It's in one of the Indiana Jones movies. Third reference there to Indiana <laughs> Jones. I think it's the last crusade they go to Petra. Um, and there's no way in except through a narrow canyon. It, even in the Bible, it was called the stronghold of Edom. You, you're safe in the rocks, the mountains. There's no way in. So they flee there, and Antichrist can't get them, okay? Uh, Bosra means sheepfold, uh, sheep pen, because... Petra is like a sheep foot. There's only one little narrow way in and no other way out. So you can't get to it. Now, when Jesus returns, this prophecy, as I say, Micah mentions it, Jeremiah mentions it, uh, here Isaiah mentions it. They say when he returns, they, they give this description. Who is this coming from Edom, from Bosra, with garments stained crimson, who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? Now, what have we just read? Jesus' garments are stained red, and he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God that we read in previous chapters. So this is clearly talking about the return of Jesus, the second coming. Let's just read down. I have trodden the winepress alone. Remember, this is the same language that Revelation is using, word for word. From the nations, there was no one with me. Who is he fighting against all the nations? None of the other nations are going to help him save Israel. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spoke battered my garments, and I stained all my clothing. It was for me the day of vengeance, the year for me to redeem had come. Why is he going to Bosra? Because that's where the faithful remnant are hiding. And they think they're going to get annihilated. But no, Jesus is coming to save them. So he's not just coming to save Israel and Jerusalem, and he actually goes to the place, and if you read Micah's uh, prophecies or Jeremiah's prophecies in Jeremiah 49 and in Micah chapter 2 it says he spreads his wings and comes to Bosra so it's almost as if when he returns he goes and gets the faithful first he brings destruction on the armies I'm not sure about the exact order theologians argue about that so let's go to the next verse chapter 5 I looked but there was no one to help I was appalled that no one gave support you see he's the lamb no one helped him open the seals. He did it by himself. No one helps him to redeem his people. He does it by himself. No one helps him. So my own arm achieved salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger, and, my, and in my wrath I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. So the only way that prophecy fits into anything is the second coming. Because it's exactly the same language about the nations of the world declaring war on God and Jesus coming to Bosra to save his people that are still there faithfully believing in him. Yeah? Now, what's interesting, Bosra and Armageddon, they're, they're, if, if you measure the distance, Bosra is in the uh, deep south of the Dead Sea and Armageddon is, is up north at the uh, plain of Jezreel. Uh, up near the mountains of Carmel. Um, does anyone know the distance between those two places? It's 1,600 stadia. And it says when Jesus returns, 
The blood of the, is to the horse's bridles for 1,600 stadia. That's the exact distance. So it would appear that he's, he's going between those two places. From Armageddon in the north, through Israel, Jerusalem as well, and down to Bosra to redeem the faithful remnant who are still believing in him. Okay, let's go back to the chart. So the next one, remember these are aspects of the return. How long this takes, I don't know. Perhaps this, you remember the day of the Lord is unlike any other day. Uh, but the time period of how all this takes, I don't know. So the next thing to understand is obviously he's coming to save Israel. Now we don't need to turn to this because we should all know this. Uh, oh, well, let's just go there. Zechariah 12 verse 10. It's easier to read it than me just try and do exposition on it. So if we can go there, Zechariah 12 verse 10 I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication they will look on me the one they have pierced well how can they do that in other words at this time Israel's eyes are opened to see who their Messiah really is the one they crucified it's not his first coming it's the second coming they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadad Rimon on the plains of Megiddo. So it talks about Megiddo there. So the Jews see what's happening and realize it all comes together. He is the Messiah, the one we've rejected for 2,000 years, for two days. On the third day, we will recognize him. Let's just read down two more verses. So it's affecting all Israel. The land will mourn each clan by itself with their wives by themselves, the clans of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives. The, and it lists there all the clans of Israel. They weep and mourn because they realize Jesus was the Messiah all along. But they repent. And what does the Bible tell us very clearly in the New Testament in Romans? The full number of the Gentiles has come in until, until the Jews have the veil removed and they recognize who their Messiah is. Then the end comes. So remember, Israel repents and accepts Jesus as Messiah, especially in Jerusalem. And so this is why Jesus now brings the whole redemption process to a conclusion. Let's go back to the chart then. So he's doing all these things when he returns. So I think, you know, there's a process, a logical format that he's following. The next one, which is one we all sort of know, he then comes to the Mount of Olives. Okay, Zechariah 14, verse 3, let's go there. Zechariah 14 and verse 3. Why does he come to the Mount of Olives? Because it's already been prophesied that's what's going to happen. Okay, so Zechariah has already said the Lord will go out and fight against these nations on the day of his battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half of the mountain moving south. So we know Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives. Why does he do that? Because it's been prophesied that that's what he's going to do. But also, when he came the first time, where did he come down? He came down the Mount of Olives. When some of them proclaimed him as king, you know, and said, Hosanna to the son of David, what was he doing? Coming down the Mount of Olives. On our Israel trips, we've walked down the Mount of Olives, down the, the path that Jesus walked down. But what did he say? He wept over Jerusalem at his first coming and says, if you had known the time of your visitation, if you'd known who it was that's really here, but now it is hidden from your eyes. You will never see me again until you are ready to say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So when they say that, when they confess who Jesus is, he comes. Where does he come? To the very place they rejected him, to the Mount of Olives. And what did the angel say when Jesus ascended? Where did he ascend to heaven from? from the Mount of Olives. And the angel said, the same Jesus who you saw ascend will come back in exactly the same way. 
to the Mount of Olives. And that's when the earthquake happens and the mountain splits and the topography of Jerusalem and the world as we know it really starts to change. That's why geography in the end times doesn't make sense to us because the earth itself is going to be shaken in a very different way. Let's go back to the chart, go to the last one then. So there's also what's called the Valley of Yehoshaphat. Yehoshaphat. Now, this is basically the Kidron Valley at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. The prophecies of Joel, we don't need to turn to it, but, but God says he's going to bring all the nations into judgment in this valley. Now, the Kidron Valley is a very long uh, valley, and God is going to judge them. Now, uh, Jehoshaphat means Yahweh judges. So that's why it's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And when the earthquake happens, this valley appears to get a lot wider, and God is going to judge all the nations on how they treated Israel, or believers in general as well. And he's going to bring judgment on everybody. Everyone is going to give an account of what they have done. That's why in uh, Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter 20. Yeah, 25, he says, when the Son of Man comes in all his glory, he will divide the nations as a shepherd divides the sheep and the goats. And what will be the criteria of how he judges? Remember, he's already taken the church. What will be the judgment criteria? Whatever you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did to me. Who were Jesus' brethren? The Jews. We often misapply that statement as though anybody is the brethren of Jesus. Now, I know there's a spiritual application there, and if you love a child, you're loving Jesus. I accept that. But literally, the application would be, how have the nations of the world treated the Jews? Because the sheep and goat judgments of Matthew 25 are actually judgment on nations of whether they've been friends of Israel or not. That's really what Jesus is talking about primarily. There is a spiritual application to us all. I accept that. But that's what he's going to do. Bring all the nations into judgment. And I think that's probably the closing act of his return. All the other aspects will have been fulfilled. And then he's going to bring that judgment. Now, this could be quite a long period of time. I don't think that will all be done in a couple of hours. I think that will all be a process that everyone will be watching. Okay then, let's go back to Revelation chapter 19 then. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 13. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Let's just read a couple more verses. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, a sharp two-edged sword, the gladius uh, two-edged sword. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. Remember what we've just read in Isaiah, so that this is the only way it fits in with the uh, prophetic fulfillment. For fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, we might miss the imagery there. When you're riding a horse, you would have your banner hanging on your, from your saddle over your thigh. So that's what it means, his banner on his... It doesn't mean it's written, he's got a tattoo on his leg. That's not what it means. It means, it means he carries his name, his banner of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Lord is our banner, remember? Yahweh Nissi is one of the names of God. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we know he's coming this. Um, just read one more verse, I suppose. No, we'll not, we'll not read that. Let's go back. So, who is with him? Let's stick to what we've just read. Okay, before we hypothesize over who we think it is. Who's coming with him? We're given a description, and they're called the armies of heaven, right? But there, are, there is a huge multitude, perhaps that no one can count, coming with him, yeah? So who are these other riders? Because we sort of, it's, it's pretty important to know who they are, 
because if we don't know who they are, it can throw our whole theology out of kilter if we don't understand who these people are. So if we just look at the description that we have of who these people are, it will give us some very clear understanding of what our role is in all this. Remember, some people believe that um, the church is still on earth through this whole process. And so Jesus is coming back to save the church. There's not going to be much church left, actually, by this point. Um, but as we've already seen through all previous teachings, that isn't what I believe the book of Revelation is, is saying at all. I think it's pretty clear in Revelation uh, 19 and, and 14. Just go to verse 14. Who these people are, just from the descriptions we've already been given. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. So if we go to the next chart, the last chart we'll look at tonight, who are these other riders? Is the church coming with him or is the church already on earth? What's happened to the church? Is the church, church is still in heaven? Is the church gone to heaven at all? Uh, what's happening? Now, we've got a brief description of who these riders are. Okay. So, the first thing to understand is they're following him. Yeah? yeah? yeah. Following him. Now, does that prove it's the church? Well, no. Except if you go to Revelation 17 and verse 14, go to Revelation 17 and verse 14, what we've already read in two previous chapters. Revelation 17, verse 14. So when the battle of Armageddon begins, yeah? They're waging war against the Lamb, the war against the Lamb that we've already looked at. But the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. As we've just read, when he returns, he's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's the other way around because this is looking into the future. In 19, it's coming the other way. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Right? So we already know who they are. They are his called, chosen, and faithful followers followers well who's that the church the believers so the believers are already coming at, not already but are coming with him yeah because we've already been told that we've already been told that when he comes in two chapters before this when he actually comes we're told that the people who are with him uh, they're called so they're not angels angels aren't called chosen You've been chosen in Christ. Jesus says, you haven't called me, I called you. I chose you, right? He's talking about believers and the faithful followers. I mean, that's what the believers were called, the followers of Jesus Christ, remain faithful. So clearly, just from the three descriptions we've got there, the people following Jesus are his believers, the church, yeah? Some people, dis they don't link the descriptions in Revelation together, and think, oh, it's just all the angels. No, 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 no. That's not what it says. It's those who are called, who are chosen, and his faithful followers. Those are the ones following with him. And this is the time when the armies come. You remember when he was on earth the first time, when the Romans came to get him, and Peter got out his sword and said, Lord, shall we strike with our swords? No. It's not the time for the end time battle. Peter did what he wanted anyway, because... That's what Peter was like, cut off someone's ear, so Jesus had to heal. He came to heal the first time. The second time he comes with his followers, it is for a battle. Yeah? So let's go back to the chart, go to the next one that will help us understand who these uh, people riding with him are. So the other riders, they're called the army of heaven, coming to fight with their Lord. Now remember, we've already looked at this, so I'll not turn to it. When Jesus stood before Pilate, he says, if my kingdom was of this earth, if my kingdom was coming now, my followers would fight. But now my kingdom comes from another place. Jesus says, my kingdom's coming from another place at another time, right? But then they will fight. So the army of heaven, Jesus said, were his followers, his people, 
Peter got it the wrong way around and wanted to fight in Gethsemane. But no, the battle comes at the end. So the army of heaven are Jesus' followers, if you piece together what Jesus said. So the next one, which is a, a simple one, really, um, and this is sort of uh, circumstantial, but nevertheless, it's, it's still clear. They are seated when they're coming with him. Now, the Bible tells us we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. So it's Christians who are seated. Now, they're seated on thrones. Remember last time we looked at the elders and how we said after the last chapter, the elders are never mentioned again. Could it be because they're not on thrones anymore, they're on horses? Now, you know, that's, that's conjecture. But nevertheless, they're, it, they're, we're told there in Revelation 19 that they are seated on horses. And the only people seated uh, in that sense are the faithful followers of Jesus Christ. The elders representing the church were seated, and we are told we are seated with Christ. So as he's seated on white horses, uh, the church is seated on white horses. I wouldn't make a total argument from that one verse, but it does still back up uh, the clarity of what we're being told here in uh, Revelation chapter 19. Let's look at the next one. Now, this is clearly for me one of the the easiest way is to prove who these people are. They are clothed in what? White garments. And we are told clearly throughout the scripture that these are the garments of salvation. Yeah? Uh, I, I've used Isaiah 61 there. Let's go there. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Because it helps us understand, now, obviously I wrote a book about the garments of God, how when God saves someone, he clothes them always. From Adam and Eve in the garden, demon-possessed people, the, the prodigal son, they're always clothed in the best garment when God saves them. And Isaiah says he's looking forward to, you know, this time of redemption. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. Now, what are we told about these garments in Revelation? They are the righteous deeds of the saints. So not only are they saved, they're wearing their righteousness. So it has to be the Christians. It has to be the church. Because they're the only ones clothed in that. They're only, only the church is clothed in salvation. Angels aren't. Only the church is clothed in salvation. And notice also what Isaiah says. They're clothed as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest. As a bride adorns herself with their jewels. They're clothed like a bride. Yeah? So they're clothed in this white linen. So if we go back to the chart... In Revelation 19 and verse 7, now we've already been told, this is what happens when people just read bits of the Bible without reading it all at once. Go back to Revelation 19 verse 7, which we looked at last time. Revelation 19 and verse 7. So this is just before Jesus returns. Yeah, this is the singing hallelujah and preparing for the return. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. The fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people or saints, depending on which translation you have. So we're already told that we'll recognize the bride when she comes with Jesus because of what she's wearing. And it tells us what she's wearing. And so now in Revelation 19, further on, it uses exactly the same description for the people riding the armies of heaven. So it's got to be the same people. It can't be anybody else. Or, or God's really confusing us, and this is only uh, several verses in front of. So he's told us this is the bride, so it's the bride coming with him. Because the description is exactly the same. Yeah, so it's the bride who is coming with him. She's already been identified. It's God's holy people, the bride, his army, his people, the saints, the ones who belong to Jesus, who he has already taken to him. Okay, let's go back to the chart. So why do so many people think it's just the angels coming with him? Well, there's good reason for that. 
Because Jesus does say that when he comes, he will bring the holy angels with him. So the angels do come with him. But the problem really is our defect in what's called angelology. We, we often have a wrong understanding of what an angel actually is. Uh, and this is throughout all Christianity. The obvious one is everyone thinks angels have got wings. Despite the fact that nowhere in the Bible does any angel ever have wings. But every Christmas card and, every, you know, Gabriel turns up with his huge wings. And the first thing I'd say is, you're not an angel, you've got wings. Um, but we, we've got it so embedded in our psyche that we just, you know, we've got all these pictures from the Renaissance and all this beautiful art. But angels don't have wings, not in the Bible. Cherubim have wings. No angels. But what actually is an angel? Okay, there's, there's two words for angel. The Greek word is angelos, where we get our word angel from. The Hebrew word is uh, malak. So the book of Malachi actually means a angel. Written by an angel. Did an angel read, write Malachi? Well, yes. But not an angel that we think of. It was a person. Can a person be an angel? Yes. Yeah, in the literal sense. Because angel is a coverall term with, you know, angels are uh, ministering spirits. They are messengers that God sends from heaven to earth or other places. Now, let me just explain this to you. Can God be an angel? Yes. Yes. Yeah, many times in the Old Testament, you read this phrase, the angel of the Lord. Right? But it's not, it's not a separate being. It's God himself. Because you will find that when people met the angel of the Lord, they then say, I've just seen God face to face. And when Joshua came to fight the battle of Jericho, remember, uh, Moses had already been told, I send my angel ahead of you to prepare the way. When he got to Jericho, he meets the angel of the Lord. And what does he do? Worship him. It's Jesus. Jesus, it's a Christophany or a Theophany, it's a pre-incarnate representation of Jesus appearing. But it's called the, the angel, the Malach or the Angelos in the Septuagint, the, the, the angel of the, the Lord. But it's God. And you'll, you'll notice in the New Testament that the resurrection and different places, sometimes people describe as seeing men and sometimes they describe as seeing angels. Um, well, which is it? Well, it, people thought angels were men anyway. You know, a lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, they, they said the men, they didn't call them angels. The Bible says they were angels. But they, they thought men. So, so that word angelos or malak is a coverall term um, for a heavenly messenger. An angel is really more of a, you could say a job description of something, someone that comes from heaven. Let me give you another example. Satan, Lucifer, he was a, a, a cherub, a cherub. We've seen that from the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel, yeah? So he's not an angel. But the Bible says that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. So he can be an angel. But he's not, in his essence, he's a, he's, a, he's a living creature. He's one of the throne guardians of God originally. So can you see, angel is a very generic term. It covers a lot of things. So when Jesus says, I'm coming with all my holy angels, it's a coverall term with, for, for everything in heaven. And an angel can be used in that way. It really can. And, and so that's why... Um, there can sometimes be confusion when you think of just an angel as just one specific thing. Now, the angels that fell in Genesis chapter 6 aren't called angels. They're called sons of God, Benaiah Elohim. And uh, they're not even called that by most of the um, um, Jewish writings of the time. In fact, Daniel, when he see sees one, he calls, he, calls them, he calls him a watcher. And you'll find that phrase used in, in books like the Book of Enoch and a lot of uh, Dead Sea Scrolls at the time. It was a term as, of one of the divine counsel of God who came to earth. They were called the Watchers, the Holy One, um, but, but then also called angels as well. 
but so they're a different being. Who actually knows how many different types of beings there are in heaven? When you think of the biodiversity on earth, who knows what there is in heaven? Um, so angel can be a generic term. Now Jesus says when we, he takes us to heaven, he says we are like the angels. Yeah? Be, being neither given in marriage or taken in marriage. So people are described as angels as well. So don't be thrown off by that term angels. It's a, it's a much broader term than people uh, can think it is. Okay. And so the final one. Um, who's Jesus bringing with him? Well, Jude's already told us of the prophecy of Enoch. Let's go there. Jude chapter 1 and verse 14. Now, this is the first written prophecy of a prophet in the Bible. 6,000 years ago. The first written prophecy, because it's written by Enoch. Enoch was raptured. Yeah? So the first person who was raptured described who was coming back when the Messiah came back, right? So if he was raptured, he knows what he's talking about, right? What did he see? Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands. I, uh, uh, that, that's a Hebraic term for an, an innumerable number. Thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude here is actually quoting from the book of Enoch. And Enoch saying, look, although I'm raptured, I see the second coming. Not the rapture, He's already been raptured. I see the return. And I see him coming with this multitude of his holy ones. Now, who are his holy ones? Now, in the Old Testament, a holy one, um, as, as I've already mentioned, it, the term is used, a holy one. It, it describes someone coming from heaven, an angel. In the Old Testament, the holy ones. In the New Testament, it describes Christians. We are God's holy ones. We are the ones who come out of heaven. We are his saints. Yeah? So, when you add all these up, you soon realize it, these people coming with him can only be one category of people. It's the only one that makes any sense. It's the same in the Old Testament. The sons of God, the Benai Elohim, referred to the angelic. It referred to the angelic order of beings, those in heaven. Not in the New Testament. In the New Testament, who are the children of God? You. We. This is what Paul's trying to get over. Do you not know you will judge angels? Do you not know you are called to be God's children? So these are the holy ones. The holy ones is his church, his bride. Those clothed as, it's, as his bride. It's the only category that fits. Okay, and this is one of the greatest arguments for people who say, you know, no one goes to Jesus until his second coming. That doesn't make any sense. Because when he comes, he brings his church with him. He's not coming to save his church. He takes his church and brings his church back when he establishes the kingdom focused around Israel. And this is all the way through the Bible. Can we go to uh, 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13? Let's go to the King James just to change the terminology. Just so, because different words are sometimes used, but it's the same meaning. It's just different translations. Sometimes use holy ones, sometimes use saints. But it's the same category of uh, people. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13. So to the end, he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with... Not for, with all his saints. Now, no one would think saints are angels. No, he's coming with his saints. Not for his saints. He's already taken his saints. He took them way back when, he, when he, we caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Go to, go to 2 Thessalonians, verse 1. 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. 
verse 10, just to make this emphatically clear, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So he's not only coming with his saints, as Paul writing to the same people, he's going to be glorified in his saints. Right? Who's, who's his glory? His bride. We've been told that very clearly in Corinthians. A man's glory is his bride. Yeah? So I just put the chart up then just to clarify this because this is one of the, the biggest arguments that people argue against the rapture or against the snatching away of uh, the church to be with God. These other people coming with Jesus can only be the church. Okay, there is followers, they're seated with him, there is army, they're the one clothed uh, as the church is clothed with salvation and their righteousness. They're clothed as the bride in the white linen, so it's got to be the church. Yes, angels as well, because that's a generic term covering uh, all the uh, divine counsel, angelic being type order, and the holy ones, the saints. So I hope we can see from that that when Jesus comes, he's bringing his church with him. He's coming to do the other stuff we've looked at. Jerusalem, Armageddon, Israel, Babylon, Mount of Olives, Bosra, to bring the judgment of God at that final stage. But he's, when he brings that judgment, he's not judging his church. That is not a, a judgment the church comes under. That is judgment on the nations of how they have blasphemed God by denying what God has clearly said in the Bible. Okay. Well, God bless you. We'll finish there.